All right, welcome. In this video, I'm going to take a look at a dynamic hashing uh, framework called extendable hashing. Uh, dynamic hashing uh, is just a method of growing our hash table uh, as we add data to it. So let's go ahead and take a look. Uh, so in our previous video, when we were looking mostly at uh, collisions and other uh, uh, ways to handle collisions, uh, and in the video prior, uh, we were looking at uh, hash tables in a static hashing uh, context. And what we mean by that is, uh, at the beginning, uh, we set the, the size of our hash table to be some fixed size, um, usually uh, calculated based on how much da data we have to put in the hash table, or based on how much data we anticipate uh, to be in the hash table. Uh, usually uh, this is this works fine if we have a hash table that is meant to just store some data uh, and if we don't anticipate to you know add more data to it uh, then having a fixed size table usually works fine uh, if we do end up adding data to it or we add more data than we anticipated um, then we might just carry out a rehash operation a rehash operation of course is just uh, basically taking all of the elements out of the table, uh, building a new table, and then hashing the elements into the new table. Uh, and of course that's going to usually take us about order n time, uh, where n is the number of entries, it takes us order n time to extract them from the old table, and order n time to put them in, into the new table, assuming we have uh, an efficient table on both sides. Uh, well, we're going to look in uh, the next uh, couple videos um, at uh, dynamic hashing methods uh, and there's sort of two dynamic hashing methods that we're going to look at uh, extendable hashing in this video uh, and then we'll look at linear hashing in a, in a future video uh, and in dynamic hashing uh, while we do sort of fix the capacity of our hash table to begin with with some initial capacity often we'll set that to be small uh, and then we will allow uh, the table to grow uh, as data is, is added uh, and we also may shrink the table as uh, data is deleted. And I think I might return to this uh, at the end, uh, but I will just comment right now that uh, we're going to focus mostly on growing the table uh, as uh, we add data. And that's because, again, I think I've mentioned in a, in a previous video that, uh, that these types of data structures are often used in databases. These databases are often very large, especially modern databases. Um, and it is much more common for us to add data to these databases than it is for us to delete data. Um, usually we're going to keep old data around at least for record keeping purposes uh, and so uh, and maybe again for querying purposes maybe someone wants to look up some old data uh, something that happened a few years ago whenever that might be. Uh, so we're going to keep it around so usually data is added and rarely is it deleted. If we're going to delete data uh, Maybe we delete data if it's old, if we're going to archive it in some other storage somewhere else, that might be possible. We'll just move it from one database to another, that makes sense. Or we might delete data uh, if there's an error in the data. Um, although again, most of the time, more often than not, we'll just overwrite that data than we would with something that's not erroneous, then we would delete it. Um, but you could imagine a case where maybe, say, duplicate records were added in and we need to delete some out, uh, you know, an error of that kind. Uh, so the delete, deletion may still occur in these types of database, but they're rare. Uh, and then uh, the other sort of, you know, reason we might not worry about shrinking the database um, is, well, if we did delete it and it was, you know, we should have sh shrunk it in, in that situation, well, we anticipate that probably soon after we're going to uh, find more data that we want to add to the database and so uh, that would cause us to grow again and rather than sort of waste operations uh, you know growing to a size we were already at and shrinking uh, we'll just maybe avoid shrinking when we uh, delete and, and then that way it will mean that we don't have to grow again uh, later. Uh, so uh, this is something again I maybe will return to at the end uh, but this is just one reason why we're going to be focusing primarily on adding to the table and, and not so much on deleting. Uh, okay so we're still sort of just focusing on this idea of dynamic hashing. Um, one thing that our two methods of dynamic hashing have in common 
Uh, is they're both going to use chaining as a, a means to handle our collisions. Uh, now remember we had two techniques to handle collisions, chaining and probing. Uh, chaining uh, relied on using additional storage, so each bucket became a linked list or, or some other data structure to store our elements in, inside the bucket. Um, and at least in principle, uh, the length or the number of elements we can store in a bucket is unbounded, it's unlimited. However, when we move into the dynamic caching, uh, for purposes I've mentioned in a couple previous videos, uh, we're going to be focusing on uh, or thinking about a case where maybe our, our data structure is so large that it's, the whole thing's not going to fit in memory at a time. Uh, and so what we're going to try and do is make sure that at least one of our, our nodes, so we're not really thinking nodes here, but we're calling them buckets now, uh, one of our buckets um, fits on one page of memory in the same way we were thinking one of our nodes in a B tree should fit in one page of memory. Uh, if we have this uh, have this bucket in, in, set up in this way, again, it makes for efficient retrieval if we have to fetch a couple different buckets uh, from memory. Again, we might need to uh, uh, fetch a couple different buckets if uh, uh, maybe if, there, if we were doing probing, that would be one case. In this case, we're doing chaining. Well, maybe the chain that, that fits in this page, um, since it's going to be a fixed length chain, it's only going to be able to fit a constant number of elements in there. That might not be long enough to fit the whole, the whole chain. And so we might have another chain, another page um, attached on the end. And in those cases, we call these overflow pages. Uh, it's basically just chaining pages instead of chaining uh, chaining keys or elements, uh, so it's just chains of chains, if you will. And then, in some tech, in some dynamic caching uh, frameworks, we will allow these overflow pages. Uh, but we'll see here uh, that in extendable hashing, the one we're going to look at in this video, uh, overflow pages are not permitted. So uh, I'm sort of mentioning here that our two our two techniques are going to differ on how they handle uh, when our chains get too large. Um, and so in extendable hashing, we just do not permit overflow pages at all. So as soon as a chain gets too large, this is what's going to trigger our split. So we'll split the page then and or split the bucket. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about how we do that. Um, and so I mentioned this, I call this an opportunistic split uh, because, uh, well, now that it has overflowed, uh, we're going to take the opportunity to split it right now instead of waiting to some other point. Um, and so that, I guess, maybe uh, brings us to our other method, linear hashing, uh, which again, we'll talk about in a, in a future video. In linear hashing, uh, we do allow to have, we do allow overflow pages. So if the chain gets too long to fit on a page, we just uh, add a reference to a second page. Uh, and then we'll start adding keys to a second page. Um, However, linear hashing still splits pages. It just doesn't split them opportunistically, uh, which creates sort of a, a strange distribution of pages. Um, it will actually split them in a linear orderly fashion. So one at a time in, an or in a very uh, obvious fixed order. Uh, so again, take a look at that future video where we take a look at linear hashing and use it to compare against uh, extendable hashing, which we're covering here uh, in this video. Okay, so let's maybe take a look at extendable hashing. Um, now, when we're working with extendable hashing, it's going to be helpful here to start out with a little bit of an example as we go. So I've got myself uh, an, a, just sort of a, a depiction of one, you know, one state that an extendable hashing framework might, might be, and this is a very small one. Uh, that's just going to be helpful for our you know, understanding uh, how, how the method works without having to be bogged down in a lot of data. Um, and so let's start out here. So the, this thing, this mentions that uh, extendable hashing uses a directory of buckets. So here we have uh, our directory on the left. Uh, and these uh, are going to be entries in the directory that have references, the arrows, pointers, to buckets. So the buckets are over here on the right hand side. And it says our directories are always going to have size equal to a power of two. So here we have four. Now the hash function that we're going to be using, uh, and in our example here, you'll notice that I've just got numerical keys here. Um, that's assuming some hashings already happened if our 
uh, keys were non-numerical, let's assume the hash functions at least turn them into a, a number. But however, we're, whatever hash function we're using uh, is going to determine a maximum size of the directory. And so in the extendable hashing framework and also in linear hashing, both are dynamic hashing models, there still is going to be a, an effective maximum size for our table. Now the benefit over static hashing where we would have a fixed size is that if the, that with the growth up to this fixed size we could actually start our dynamic hashing models off very small. So imagine we're going to start off with a thousand entries but over time it might grow to be a couple billion entries then uh, a hash function, a standard hash function that outputs 32-bit uh, values is going to have a, about a space for about 4 billion entries. So our table using a standard hash function would be able to grow up to that size. In a static hashing model, we would have to initialize the table to be 4 billion or a billion, however big to start out, which means that initially when we only have a thousand entries store stored in there, we're wasting a, a tremendous amount of space um, to just store a thousand entries. So in a dynamic hashing model, even though we might have a same sort of theoretical maximum, um, we won't be wasting space while our database only has a thousand entries or a million entries. Until it grows to be a billion entries, uh, it will grow in size uh, sort of seamlessly with our data. And then as we face with static hashing, if we actually grow beyond our maximum size, then we still need to ha rehash. And we probably need a new hash function because our hash function determines uh, uh, how many buckets we, or how many entries in our, our directory we can have. Now, I mentioned here a, a sort of a 32-bit type of hash function. Uh, if you've been working in Java, which is very common, um, the hash code method in there returns a 32-bit integer. Uh, and so, that's the kind of framework we might be imagining. Well, imagine your, your database is much larger than 4 billion. That's something, certainly something that a lot of our databases are. Uh, well, then we just need more bits on, on our hash function, which just means we need a, a bigger hash function. And so we could jump up to say 64 bits, which of course is tremendously uh, larger. There's so much space in 64 bits. Uh, often we don't jump all the way to 64 bits if we uh, need something bigger, um, maybe 48 bits, you know, if that's not big enough, something in the 50s uh, certainly should be big enough. Remember, every time we increase the bit width, we double the size. So just moving here from um, uh, 32 bits to just add one more bit on there, 33 bits, we're up to 8 billion. Okay, you know, 34 bits is up to uh, 8, doubled again, 16 billion. Okay, so continue, uh, again, we're, every time we're doubling. So taking it up to 64 uh, is, again, multiplying it uh, uh, by an incredible amount, multiplying it by, well, four, about 4 billion. Uh, again, another way to think of that, 2 to the 32 squared is 2 to the 64. Well, that would be about 4 billion squared. Okay, again, uh, pretty large. Uh, okay, so again, because of this, we're going to pick a reasonable maximum size for our directory. However, uh, we're not going to consider the rehashing case. Most of our uh, directories are going to remain small in our examples. Okay, so the other thing is, as I mentioned, that if our directory is going to grow, then it's usually smaller than this maximum size. Um, so there's going to be some bit width smaller than, say, 32 um, that that it's going to determine our directory. And in, that, in this case, our directory seems to only be two bits wide. And that, this number two here is indicating that our directory is two bits wide. And we call this value the global depth of the directory. So our directory has global depth two. And a directory with global depth d has two to the d entries. In our case, two to the two is four. So we have four entries. Maximum size would be our maximum bit width this case 32 bits, or in our example here we're actually going to consider 6 bits since we don't need 32 bits, that's a lot more than we'll need. Um, and then that, uh, then our, our, our 
global depth here, D, it must be less than or equal to that maximum depth. Okay, now all our buckets over here, uh, as I've mentioned sort of earlier in motivation, our buckets are intended to store uh, to be one page large. So they're a chain, uh, but the length of that chain is, is dependent on the size of the, well, the size of our entries and the size of the uh, page itself. Now each of our buckets here is going to also have a bit width depth. We call it its local depth. We have here local depth 1, 2, and 3. And we will, we'll call the local depth lowercase d. Our, our local depth must always be less than or equal to our global depth. So we'll see that's true at least in our example here. And then importantly, uh, the keys stored in our bucket so if, if we have a bucket here, this one says of local depth 1. Uh, if they have local depth D, they have the same D least significant bits, i.e., that is, in a different, in a different way of saying that, is that they must be equivalent mod 2 to the D. So let's maybe look at this one here. These ones must all be equivalent mod 2 to the 1 or 2. They must be all odd, and they all are. Let's take a look at this a little bit more detail so we'll see that the data that I'm going to be using here are always all going to be integers between 0 and 255. So here I've just selected data between 0 and 255. The hash function we're going to use is going to be uh, mod 2 to the 6. Effectively all that I'm saying here is that the data we have between 0 and 255, uh, that's 8-bit data, right? Uh, 8 bits. And by doing mod 2 to the 6, we're just saying get rid of the, the most significant bits. The first two bits, we'll just truncate them off and only concern ourselves with the lowest uh, six bits, which means the maximum size of our directory in this case would be 2 to the 6 or 64. We're not going to get that large, um, and we'll see in a second we probably don't need to. Um, the global depth we already mentioned of our current directory is 2, uh, so, they, so we only need two bits. So when we do our mod function here, even though it's going to give us six bits, at the moment we only need to look at two of them. And again, they're the least significant bits. Okay, we don't need to look at the most significant bits. And then finally, as I mentioned earlier, we've got pointers to our buckets. Now, we've, for my example here, I'm going to only allow there to be four entries in each bucket. So that's just going to make it easy for us to do our examples and so we don't fill our buckets up with a lot of data. Uh, and actually this is going to be a good choice for us because we have 64 possible uh, entries in our directory and each entry could point to a bucket with four elements in it. If we actually had all 64 and each one had all four filled, that would be one location for all 256 pieces of data that we have. So this is actually a very special case, which would mean that no rehashing would be necessary with our data. So this is sort of an example. If we know our data is going to be in this range, we're going to start out with a handful, but it's going to grow up to be uh, at most uh, uh, 255 pieces or 256 pieces of data. Then this design of our hash table, four pieces per bucket, 64 uh, potential buckets, is a good design because it accommodates all of our potential data. Now, of course, if we say extended this so our data went up to 512 or 1024, then we might need to do a rehash if we designed it this way. We might want to uh, pick different values. Okay, so we did take a quick look at our local depth one here, but we see here that local depth one means that the values in the bucket agree on the least significant bit. That means they're either even or odd. So all these ones are odd. We'll also notice here that two directory entries are pointing there. And that's because if we were to take any of our hash function, any of our keys, put it our hash function, let's say 91, 213, 11, or, or 251, if we put them through our hash function, because these are all odd numbers, we know they end with a 1. They're not going to be 0, 0, or 1, 0. But we don't know what that next bit is. Okay, with local depth 1 here, we're saying they only agree on that, that least significant bit. They might disagree on the next one, and we'll see in a second they, some of them do. Um, some have 0 and some have 1 on that next bit. So what this local depth 1 is telling us 
is that all these elements in this bucket uh, are odd. They agree on their least significant bit, but they maybe uh, disagree on that other one. So that's why there's two pointers, two different pointers coming from our directory here. Now these other two buckets, these ones have uh, local depth 2. And what local depth 2 is telling us is that each one of these uh, entries inside this bucket agree on two of their bits. So that's why we only have one pointer here. The, these ones here, well, there's only one, they, the, the 56 has its last two bits 0, 0, but the 14, 54, 78, and 142 have last two bits 1, 0. They're both even, right? But we have two buckets set up here. And the reason is, of course, all five of these would not fit in just one bucket. So there must have been a split that got us to this state. Okay. All right, so let's take a look at what's going to happen when we add uh, to our bucket. So adding to a hash table is going to start out just normal using our normal hash table uh, add, which is just to use our hash function to look up the location of the bucket. Now in this case, um, the hash function in the original case might just immediately give us a, a bucket ID, maybe an, a memory location of our bucket. In, uh, in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to have to take one additional step where we go through the directory. We're going to use our hash function and it's going to then be looked up in the directory, which might mean uh, truncating some more bits, doing another mod, uh, and then once we've done that, following the directory pointer to the bucket. So there's sort of one extra uh, dereference here, one, that, one extra pointer we need to dereference if we want to uh, follow our, our look up here. Of course, if we were uh, counting, if we were really counting these in our normal hash table case, that's one dereference. Here it's two. Of course, that's not a big extra cost, so we're not really worried about that. So we go to the bucket. If we get to the bucket and it's free, well, that's the good case. We just go ahead and add it. Go ahead and add it in. If it's not free, meaning it's full, then we have to do something else. So if it's if it is if it's full and the local depth of our bucket is less than the global depth of the directory, so we we can't do a split right away. We will do a split in this case, but if if we have a full bucket, first we must check its local depth. If its local depth is less than the global depth, then we can go ahead and split. If the local depth is not less than the global depth, then that really gives us two possibilities. It could be equal to or greater than. Well, actually, it's not going to be able to be greater than because we're going to avoid that case. So in the other possibility, our local depth might be equal to the global depth of the directory. That case, our split is not possible, which means we now have another check to do. So again, we've checked here. It's not free. It's full. Also, our local depth is equal to the global depth. That means now we're going to check our global depth. Is the global depth less than the maximum global depth? Okay, remember we have our, our global depth D and then the maximum, which might be say like 32. In our example, it was six. If it's still less than the maximum, we have space to grow the directory, so we will do that. If that's not the case, then we've reached the maximum depth. We've got a full bucket, we need a rehash, okay? Um, now at each of these cases, if we, uh, if we you know, have to do a split, a directory grow, or a rehash afterwards, then we do sort of a recursive step where we try and add uh, the element again. So what that usually results in, uh, ignoring the rehash for a second, is say we do a, we have to trigger a directory grow, we'll grow the directory, then that usually means we have to do a, a bucket split, and then we'll finally go in and hopefully have free space to add to the bucket. Okay, so uh, sort of just finishing this off, I just want to uh, remark that the expected runtime for our uh, adding to extendable hashing framework is still going to be a constant amount of time. And this depends on a couple things. Now remember, adding to a hash, hash table depends on a few assumptions. Usually, one, that we've got a good hash function that distributes our keys uniformly. Two, that our data isn't skewed. It's not all going into one bucket because our data uh, all has, say, the same ID or, or uh, poorly chosen IDs. Given those assumptions, uh, then uh, we can do an additional analysis. First of all, our split, we haven't got to this yet, but our splits are only going to do an extra constant amount of effort. Okay, And this is mostly dependent on the fact that 
the size of our bucket uh, is going to be uh, a constant size. To carry out a directory grow, we need to actually duplicate the directory. That's something we'll see in a second. Um, and as a result, that's a copy. That's a, this is uh, similar to the case of doing a grow on an array list. Uh, and, and so in this case, we're going to have to copy all the entries down. And that depends on the size of the actual directory. Well, remember the size of a directory is going to be 2 to the d, where d is the global depth uh, of the uh, directory. Okay, so um, it's possible that our assumptions might be violated. If our assumptions are violated, uh, we can get what's called a cascade of split or grows. Uh, and that's where a split triggers a split, triggers a split, triggers a split, and we have to end up growing the directory maybe uh, a number of times before we can accommodate our add. These are unlikely. It's usually when our assumptions are violated, meaning all our keys are going into one bucket for some reason, skewed data or bad hash function. Um, so most of the time that doesn't occur. Okay, I want to look at a couple of examples here, uh, but let's get started again with a, a simple case here. So let's say we want to add 12 into our table. Okay, so the first thing we're going to want to do is put our hat, our 12 through our hash function. Uh, so hash of 12 is 12 for simplicity. And if we want to write 12 in binary, we can verify a plus four. Uh, we have this, this uh, is our binary expression. Um, now, I've got this stated in two ways here. Um, to access this uh, directory, we either need to know what the last two bits are, 0, 0, or uh, because the bit width here, the global depth is 2, or we can do 12 mod 4. So I usually leave this up to uh, whatever you feel more comfortable doing. If you can convert to binary easily, or maybe you have a, you know, a calculator at hand, uh, and, and you do that, uh, then you can quickly access the binary value and use that to determine where you're going. Otherwise, if you're you know pretty good at doing mods, 12 mod 4 is pretty easy to see as 0. Uh, that might be easier for us to do. Uh, we see that that comes out 0. Okay, 13 mod 4 would be 1. That would give us this one. Uh, you know, 15 mod 4 would be 3. That would give us the last bucket. Okay. All right. Well, in any case, this one gives us 0. Uh, so we see we're in, in bucket zero. So we follow our, our pointer. We see we have space. We add the 12 and we're done. Straightforward. This is an easy case. All right. Um, say we get into a not easy case now. We don't have space. So we're trying to add to a full bucket. In that case, we're going to trigger what we call a bucket split. If we want to do a bucket split, uh, again, the first thing we need to do is check to see if it's possible. So. Uh, we'll first check to make sure our local depth is less than the global depth. Uh, and then we'll, if it's true, then we'll be able to carry out our split. Now first, I just want us to remind ourselves uh, that the keys in this bucket we know already agree on the D least significant bits. Okay, So because of that, uh, that means we can uh, we know whatever those bits are, say, say there's three of them at 0, 1, 1. We know that all the uh, all the keys in that uh, bucket all end 0, 1, 1. Okay. However, we don't know about their next bit, the D plus first least significant bit. They all agree on the first D, but doesn't say anything about the next one. There's a possibility they agree on the next one, but more likely they don't agree. Okay, because we've only put them in this bucket because they agree on the least significant bits, we haven't looked at this bit yet. So with all likelihood, some of them probably have a zero in this location and some of them have a one in this location. So that's how we're going to split our bucket. We're going to take the elements that have a zero in this location and we're actually going to leave them in the same bucket. Well, the, it depends on how you want to think of this. You can think of this as creating two new buckets and splitting them up. But one of our buckets is going to have the same ID as the original bucket. So this is what I'm calling the original bucket. By putting a zero in front, uh, we get the same number. Uh, so, uh, so, so again, in this case, that's un not changing the number. So I'm going to consider that to be the original bucket. But if you had a one in front, if you had a one in that, uh, that D plus first least significant bit, 
then we'll put you in a different bucket. And the second bucket we'll call the split image. So we're doing a split here. We have the original bucket and its image, the split image. Okay. So we'll split the bucket. That's the new one. Uh, all the elements that have a one in that location are placed there. Now, since we've split the two buckets, now we know they do agree on their D plus first least significant but bit. All the ones in the original bucket have a zero there. All the ones in the uh, split image have a one there. So now in both of these buckets, we know they agree on D plus one bits, not just D. And since they agree on D plus one bits now, that means their local depth must be D plus one. So after the split, we've increased the local depth of both of the buckets, the new one and the original. Okay, now usually after we've done the split, like I mentioned, hopefully some of them had a zero there, some of them had a one there. So this key that we're adding, we knew that it was going into this bucket, so it must agree on those D least significant bits, but we don't know if it had a zero or a one there. So when we try to add K again, we have to again recursively here, we'll go back to our hash function and, and go back to the table now, okay? Because when we split this bucket, one of those pointers is gonna go to the original bucket and the other one has to go to the new one, right? So we go look it up again in the table and depending on which of those entries we were, we'll either go to the original bucket or the split image, okay? Now, whichever one it tells us to go to, that's the correct one, so we'll go there and hopefully, typically, usually, there's free space there and so we're done. If there isn't free space there, we're back to square one. We might have to split again um, well, if there is no free space there, then we probably have to split again, and the split could cause a cascade, more than one split, or another a directory grow. Uh, so there's more work to be done in that case. But let's assume there's free space, and in our first example here, that's going to be the case. So let's see here. Uh, so let's take a look at 97. So again, let's try and think, let's throw it through our hash function. What was our hash function? Our hash function was mod 64. Now this is greater than 64, but maybe it's easy for us to see that this is 64 plus 33. So when we do mod 64, boom, we get out 33. Okay, 33 also, hopefully uh, most of us find that's an easy one to convert to binary. It's a 32 and a one, right? 32 and a one, and let's make sure 32, 16, 8, 4, 2, 1. Okay, so we got it right. 32 and a one, all right? Which means, now look at our, looking at our directory, we're done if we, if we knew that. It ends 0, 1. Or throw it through our mod function. Mod 2 to the power 2 is 4. That is, well, 32 obviously is 8 times 4. 32 plus 1, so this must be 1. Again, telling us bucket 1. Now, notice bucket 1 is pointing here. This bucket here. Entry one, I should say, is pointing at this bucket here. We could call this bucket one, but we could also call this bucket three because entry three is pointing here. And really what we should call this bucket, if we wanted to give it a name, is bucket odd because these entries only agree on their least significant bit, which is a one, meaning they're all odd. And we verified that earlier when we were looking at the, the example. So not surprisingly, 33 is odd, it belongs in bucket odd, and so when we looked it up in our table, it pointed to bucket odd. So, so far, so good. Only problem, bucket odd is full. So we wanna split. Now remember, the first thing we need to check is our local depth less than our global depth. Yes, it is. And that means we can do a split. Now, another way we can check that, uh, if you've got a diagram here, if you're doing it by hand, of course, and programmatically, we need to compare that, but we can see here there's, there's two pointers here. If there's more than one pointer, then we are able to do a split. So we could split this, one of the pointers at one bucket, one at the other, okay? So, and again, we can see that because our local depth is less than our global depth. Okay, good, so we do know a split can happen. So what we wanna do is split this bucket here. Now to split this bucket, we actually have to go through sort of a, a, a very minor rehash, if you will. We have to look at each one of these entries and figure out, since it's in this bucket, we know that it's either a 0, 1, or a 1, 1, but now we need to know which one you are. Are you a 0, 1, or are you a 1, 1? So again, remember, we were just looking at our, our the, the split uh, algorithm. It says, check our local depths, 
to our global depth here, since it says one, we know that they agree on their one. So the D plus first bit that we're looking at now is the next one. Is it a zero or is it a one? Another way of saying that is, is the last two bits zero, one, or one, one? Or another way of saying that is mod four, do we get one or three? Again, all of these are, are odd. So mod four, if all you know about it is that it's odd, then mod four, you know it must be a one or a three. And these are all ones or three. So again, in the split, we could put it through the mod operation and say, are you a one or a three? Let's go ahead and do that. So uh, I've gone ahead and calculated uh, each one of these in binary to make it a little bit easy for us. Uh, so we can see here, if we calculate 91 into binary, get this value here. Again, we're really only concerned with the last two bits. They're one, one. That tells us it should be in the bucket that ends up being the split image, the one, one. Okay. Again, what this tells us is if we did 91 mod uh, 4, we should get 3. And let's go ahead and verify that. 91, I'm doing some quick math in my head, 88 is 4 times 22. So that 88 must be 0. 88 plus 1, 2, 3 is 91. So again, yes, 91 mod 4 is 3. So 91 belongs in bucket 3. Okay. Um, we can go through the rest um, and maybe go ahead and verify my math for me. Uh, 213 uh, is the only one here that ends 0, 1. The rest are all 3's mod 4. They all end 1, 1. So when we do our split here, 213 will remain in the original bucket with ID 1, whereas the other 3, 91, 11, and 251, will arrive in the split image. Okay, so that's where we get 213 stays in bucket 1 and the other 3 all end up in bucket 3. Notice the local depth went up. We, we were at 1, we're now at 2 after the split because we now need 2 bits to, to uh, identify our bucket and all of the entries in that bucket agree on those 2 bits. Now our entry that we're trying to add here is uh, 33 and it's it was a zero one so it belongs here in this bucket so remember we do that recursively after after the split we try and add it again because that split that bucket has been split now we don't know if it belongs in the original or the split image in this case it belonged in the original now the other thing I just want to point out with this example is this example actually followed through a, a longer example where I just inserted some entries here. And you'll notice that because of the opportunistic way that we split our buckets, the way that I've ordered my buckets on the right hand side are 0, 2, 1, 3. And that's just because of how I had organized them earlier when I had done my split. Now, uh, the idea there being that I started with 0, 1, I split 0 first, which gave me 0, 2, 1, and then I split 1, which gave me 0, 2, 1, 3. Okay. Now what this, what I'm trying to uh, point out here, which is something that we'll, we will contrast with in uh, our linear hashing video, is that in extendable hashing, because of opportunistic splitting, uh, you can end up with a real strange array of buckets. So prior to this, maybe let's just go back here in this case we have one of our buckets that could be potentially split it's possible actually that we don't split this one that we say split this one and grow our directory instead and we could end up with a case where where we end up with four pointers here or eight or 16 and so on meaning we might never split this one as long as we don't get odds if we just keep getting evens they're all going to end up in these two buckets okay uh, so through opportunistic splitting, we won't always end up in a case like this where we have sort of this even split where we have one bucket for every entry. We'll often have overlapping pointers. Okay, well, this, we'll see this more in a second when we do our directory grow. Okay, so the next case we want to look at is say we have to do a split, but our local depth is equal to the global directory the global depth of the directory. So again, in this example, we notice that's true of all of our buckets. So if we add to, say, bucket uh, bucket 2, 
bucket two is already full, that's going to be our next example, uh, what happens in that case. Okay, it says we're going to have to do a directory grow. Now in a directory grow, what do we do? Well, we double the size of the directory. Now we do this by adding one to the global depth. Remember our directory size is always two to the D, so adding one makes it two to the D plus one. That's doubling the size. Now there's actually a pretty easy way for us to, to do the doubling because what we do is we just copy the whole directory down into uh, the second ch chunk. Uh, so copying the whole directory doubles it. And then we just need to be careful that all the ones that that uh, we started with, those all get leading zeros and all the new ones get leading ones. The other thing we'll notice as a result of this is that every bucket is going to double up its references. So if it had one before, it'll have two now. If it had two before, it'll have four now and so on, meaning the number of references to any bucket will always be a power of two. Uh, and that number of references to any bucket also indicates how many times it can be split before uh, we need to do a directory grow. Okay, so again, after the grow, we're going to try to add again, but the trying to add again means we're going to try and do a split again, because the way we triggered our grow was we tried to do a split, but our local depth was too big. Uh, growing the directory increases uh, the, the global depth, so by increasing the global depth, we now can split. So the split is now uh, is, is going to work, uh, but we are not necessarily guaranteed that the add will work because after the split we're not guaranteed that the node that we're adding or the bucket we're adding to will be have room, will have free space. It might be full still. Again, if it happens to not be uh, uh, to not have free space, if it happens to be full, then we get another split, we trigger another split, and because we had to do a directory grow already, uh, we'll have to do another directory grow. So this can cause our cascade of splits and grows in this case. Um, and so I just put a comment here. Well, what's the worst our cascade could be? Uh, well, I, absolute worst case, we start out with a directory that has, say, width zero or, or one, um, meaning we're looking at only one bit or no bits at all. Um, and we grow up to the maximum size, 32 bits, something like that. Okay. Uh, well, turns out that's not too bad. If that's 32 grows. Um, it's really bad because it makes our directory really big and we don't want that. Um, but it doesn't actually take a lot of time. Okay. Um, it, it's usually, in this case, the M is usually going to be logarithmic in the number of entries in our table. Now, in that extreme case, that's going to be a little bit harder to argue, but um, 32 is still not awful even if we have a hundred or a thousand entries in our in our directory. Now of course each directory grow itself costs effort uh, so we'd have to take a look at that but it's still going to be linear in the eventual size of the table. Now the, the problem with that is if we grow up to say two, size 2 to the 32 now we're talking about the effort there is 2 to the 32 so this could be a costly uh, a costly step but uh, again, we usually avoid this by having uniform hashing assumptions, meaning that we have a good hash function and well-behaved data. All right, so let's take a look at uh, another sort of final example here. Uh, I'm going to consider adding an entry here, uh, 146. Now, 146, uh, I've sort of by design tried to get an entry um, that's going to uh, put us into this full bucket here too. Uh, so again, if we hash 146, that's pretty large. Um, we might again notice that 64, we're doing mod 64 here, uh, so we want those last six bits. Uh, well, uh, 64, uh, this is definitely larger than 64, it's actually larger than 64 times 2, which is 128. Uh, and we can see that it is indeed 18 plus 128. So, uh, mod 64, we can see indeed it is 18, and 18 is a 16 and a 2. 16, 8, 4, 2, 1, right? So 16 and a 2. Uh, and again, if we did mod 4 on it, 18 mod 4, that's a pretty easy one to do, is also 2. Oh, I wrote it here in binary. Um, okay, so following, following that, either looking at those last two entries or uh, taking our, our mod value in binary so we can look it up in our table, 
we uh, indeed see we should go to bucket two. Uh, well, this bucket is full, so we want to do a split. So the next thing we check is how's our local depth doing? It's equal, so we must do a directory grow. Okay, so in our directory grow, let's go through this a couple steps here. So again, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to copy down my directory. So here, I've copied it down, and in copying, I'm copying all the values, and I'm copying all the pointers. So we'll notice that this pointer goes to here, the next one goes here, the next one goes here, and the last one goes here, again, at the order of 0, uh, 2, 1, 3. Okay. Now, the last thing I did, and this is sort of important, is when we copy it down, we can't just have the same entries down here, 0, 1, 2, 3, 0, 1, 2, 3. So the new ones get leading ones. The old ones we just had with some zeros, so they're still 0, 1, 2, 3. But now we get 4, 5, 6, 7 as our next four entries. Now that's doubled the size of our directory. It's also doubled the number of references on all of our nodes. So all of our nodes could not have been split before. Well, now all of them can be split. Again, I'm sort of using nodes and buckets interchangeably here. I'm going to try and say bucket as much as possible. In addition, uh, we've increased our global depth. We can see three bits are needed now, Okay, which means if we were doing our hash function now, we actually need to know hash uh, mod 8 instead of mod 4 now. Okay, Luckily, we have our, our node here in uh, written in binary, so we know that 18 is going to be a 0, 1, 0. We'll see in a second that's, again, helpful. Uh, why is that? Well, uh, remember, after we do a directory grow, our attempt is to split this bucket again. Okay, we want to split the bucket. To do that, we need to run it through our hash function. The new hash function will be mod 8, or we can look at its next bit in binary. Okay, well, we run all these values through binary. They all are 6 mod 8, or they all have a 1 in that third bit. What that means is after our split, they all end up in the split image. All of our entries move down to the split image. Which, so now let's sort of pause here and, and consider. If we had got a, a different value here, say we had got... Um, if we add 4 to this, right, if we add 4 to this, we'd get a 1 here instead. We would end up with 1, 1, 0, and that would tell us to go into this bucket here. Well, this would be this cascade I'm talking about. If it tells us to go into that bucket again, what would we have? Well, 3 and 3, so we'd have to do another grow. We'd do another grow, double up again, and then we'd split again. Okay, now at the next bit, let's just maybe go back. Um, we can see that some of them had zeros and some had ones. So the next one wouldn't trigger another one. Um, luckily, though, I designed this the way I designed this, so that 146 uh, actually is 010, so it actually belongs in, in this bucket here. So we're actually good there. Okay. So I do just want to finish sort of with the comment that I started on at the beginning, which is to comment on deleting from our extendable hashing framework. Um, now, I'll start by just saying that, that we normally just delete as normal. We, we do step one here. Uh, we uh, look for the, we do use our hash function to look up the bucket. We find the element in the bucket and we delete it. So one and, and step 1.1. One only if we are concerned about making sure our hash table can shrink as we delete data too. Some hash tables will want to do this, but not many. Then we'll do step two and three as well. Okay. So step two then, if we delete the last entry in our bucket, then that means we can merge it with our split image. No matter how many entries are in our split image, if our split image is full, if we're empty, we can merge it and we'll just end up with a full, in, full new bucket. Okay. Now remember, the reason why we might avoid doing this is if we take that full split image, merge it, and then we add to that bucket again, we're immediately going to do a split. It's wasted effort to do both of those operations. Okay. Um, now, after we do the split, if we now, because remember in this, in, uh, sorry, not a split, after we do a merge, if we merge with a split image, sorry, um, when we do that, our, our local depth is going to go down. 
So after this step, we can check if all the local depths are beneath the global depths, we can shrink the directory as well. Again, we might want to avoid this because then we might do a split immediately and have to uh, grow it right, right again. And a grow is quite expensive, so we definitely might avoid this one. So this comment that I'm, I'm making here is that in practice, we actually avoid this shrinking operation. And instead, uh, we sort of stop after 0.1.1 .1 here. We just very straightforwardly go to the bucket, delete it, and we're done. With, again, with the anticipation that maybe that was erroneous and we're just gonna overwrite it again right away. So we don't want, if we're just gonna delete out a batch and rewrite them back in again, we don't wanna shrink the directory and then grow it back up again. Okay, so uh, this was this video is intended to just explore, uh, you know, how to add and this last little bit how to delete from an extendable hashing framework. Uh, in my next video, I just want to explore this in more detail by doing an example. We'll start with an empty table uh, and we'll try and fill it up with some entries. Um, so uh, thanks again for watching. Stay tuned for the next one, and we'll see you in the next video.